Today on Citizen Journalism, the future of news. What is citizen journalism? It's the blogging, it's, it's, it's Facebook, it's Twitter. I saw everything that you see on television. You know, the devastation, the misery, uh, the deplorable conditions. Personal adventures become news when readers take the initiative while abroad. And later... A blogger is a journalist, but with an opinion. And opinions I do have. Experiencing a day in the life of one of New Brunswick's most eccentric bloggers. Hello, I'm Jocelyn Turner and welcome to Citizen Journalism, the Future of News. This program was entirely produced by New Brunswick Community College students. Today on the show, we'll explore citizen journalism and the issues it raises. But first, what is citizen journalism? In an age where anyone can become an instant reporter, it leaves professional journalists wondering what the future holds. Michael McDonald reports. Do you blog or use Facebook? What about Twitter? If you spread or editorialize the news, you may be unknowingly participating in what some in the media call citizen journalism. Joel O'Kane is a Simon editor with The Daily Gleaner. It's uh, blogging, uh, using Twitter, using uh, Facebook to, uh, you know, to talk about the issues. Anyone can become a citizen journalist. Sometimes people like Charles the Blogger have a major impact through new media. I, I guess I would have to say it's the blogging, it, it, it's Facebook, it's Twitter, it, it's all these forms of um, modern social media. There seems to be some understanding of what citizen journalism is, but rarely is there consensus. Because it is such a broad topic, there is some uncertainty, even among professionals. Mitch Greencorn has seen this evolution occur. Years ago, it was radio, print, and TV. Now you have internet, now you have smartphones, now you have email, now you have social media, and it's just getting more and more uh, intense. Throughout the show, we'll take a look at the different roles citizen journalists play, such as during the September 11th attacks. In Woodstock, Michael McDonald, Community College News. Have you ever snapped a photo or shot a video of something you think could be a news story? If you think people would want to know, maybe a newsroom would too. Ashley Dunbar reports on the public's ability to contribute to the news. Citizen journalism is everywhere in today's world. From people being able to tweet news tips, upload photos, and send in video, it has changed the role of the professional journalist. This, this technology has citizen journalists, it's made everyone a citizen journalist, really. And it's kind of turned us into, as professional journalists, the people who try and sift through that and find out what's real and what's important and present those packages to people. Daryl McIntyre is the senior producer for CBC News in Fredericton. He says citizen journalism will only increase in the future. I see it kind of continuing along the path that it's been continuing on for years. It's just, you know, there are more and more opportunities because of technology for citizens to take part in the process, and I don't see that changing. Local news reporter and announcer at CJ104 in Woodstock, Paul Bradley, says having people submit news tips has played a huge role in their newsroom. So we have a lot um, of area to cover between the two of us, and a lot of it we wouldn't hear about it, um, but we get tips. Fear they'll be wiped out. Bradley says people can submit news items to the newsroom through phone, email, and social networking sites. Facebook is another big one now. I've, you know, this morning I was on Facebook. And I found uh, you know, two comments from a couple people about different things. There are more than 500 million users on Facebook and 200 million on Twitter. It is inevitable that journalists will go on these social networking sites to find news and to report it. In Woodstock, Ashley Dunbar, Community College News. The journalism program at NBCC Woodstock aims to introduce students to a real-life newsroom environment. News stories for print, radio and television are produced each week and are often featured in local media. Learn more about the program at jschoolnbcc.ca. Twitter has become a prominent site for posting news. The amount of people using Twitter has grown by 33% just this month. But what place does it have in the Citizen Journalist Toolkit? Twitter can be accessed anywhere. Now, anyone can report the news in 140 characters or fewer. Conestoga journalism student Kenny Bellavo says Twitter should not be considered a news source. But it does not tell a whole story. All you can do is give someone a quick, just like, 20-second update of what's actually happening. You can't tell them a full story on Twitter. 
We don't have very many followers or anything. Mount Allison student Tim Sonier is an avid tweeter. He thinks people on Twitter often break news before traditional media. You know, like the, the Japanese earthquake was a good example because I, I heard about it hours before even CNN had posted anything about it. Sonia says even though Twitter is a social network, it is still a reliable source for news. So yeah, I don't know. It's been great. People are, people are able to get things out even when there are media blackouts. Uh, I give him the one uh, that's on the front page, or which we talk about. The Beagle about Observer's managing editor, yeah, Jim Dumville, says a lot of news media are turning to social networks like Twitter to cover stories taking place far from home. I mean, they're covering what's going on in uh, the Middle East basically through cell phone images and YouTube and, uh, and Twitter. Bellavo is still a little concerned about depending on Twitter as a news source. I think Twitter is more of like a personal website where, you, where people give personal updates about their own life. I don't think it's a news-oriented site because there's you can't say enough on Twitter to get people interested in what you're what the story you're telling. Like Bellavo, Dumville is concerned about Twitter and professional news. My big fear is. It's so immediate, we don't have a chance uh, to check facts. Whether Twitter is used for personal gossip or to post breaking news, this relatively new form of social media is emerging as an important tool for citizen journalists. And professional journalists are also recognizing its advantages. In Woodstock, Jocelyn Turner, Community College News. Everyone is surrounded by the media, but did you know that local thin media like community newsletters and coffee news also consider themselves to be members of the media? Jill Constantine reports. The local coffee news might not be something you consider seriously. These important community publications offer something traditional media does not. From a community perspective, it's good because there's, it's a, it's a collective point where people can go and say, oh, here's what's going on in the community. Oh yeah, here we go. These local papers, often called thin media, are usually published by small, independent owners. Woodstock this week prints 2,000 copies a month for a population of just over 5,000. It certainly is part of media because if you put ink on a piece of paper, that's media. If, if it has any readership, more than one person, it's media. Town newsletters like First Town News in Woodstock are also a great source of information for journalists. I do send it to, to our local media and I think they sometimes use that as story as the stories that are in it that they may not know about. Locals contribute all of the stories to these publications. Because all of the stories in these thin media publications are submitted by residents, they are great examples of citizen journalism. In Woodstock, Jill Constantine, Community College News. When we come back, who is accountable for what you read or watch in the news? They should be calling in, they should be helping us to, to be better at our jobs. And later, we see just how a blogger gets his story. Lights bright, the uh, siren going, so of course I threw my coffee aside and my water bottle flew and I came here. Find print, radio, and television stories from New Brunswick Community College journalism students online. Visit our website at jschoolmbcc.ca for these and other reports. Irving-owned Brunswick News dominates the newspaper industry in this province. However, small citizen-led organizations are starting to carve out their own niche. Ethan Hazlitt has more. Looking like every other house on the street, not much is different at this home. At least, not on the outside. Um, so we decided that we would get together and form a cooperative where the, the members would support the, uh, the, the media co-op. They would uh, write for it, read it, sustain it financially. The Brief. It's a two-page monthly of the online site created by Tracy Glenn. Like other newspaper owners, she understands that you need to be online, and for now, she has a slight advantage. I think we could have gained quite a bit by being online. Um, we've we've set ourselves back a little bit, and now we're we're trying to catch, play uh, a little bit of catch up. Large newspapers such as Brunswick News need more time to successfully go online, but that's not the only reason why NB Media Co-op has been a success. We would be telling stories from from the marginalized voices, so often those voices tend to get 
um, ignored or distorted in, in the media. With so few independent newspapers left in New Brunswick, it leaves a field that needs to be filled, says Glenn. And that's what the public is doing, by going on to blogging sites and other online sources. Citizen journalists, though, like Glenn, are volunteering to help take back their local news. In Woodstock, I'm Ethan Hazlitt, Community College News. Do you trust the news you read or watch? Well, it appears that not all news is as accurate as you would want it. Journalists do make mistakes, and as Tony Bourgeois discovers, some citizens are eager to keep a watchful eye. People make mistakes, and journalists are not exceptions. Professor of Journalism Scott R. Mayer says only one out of 50 factual errors are caught in daily newspapers before publication. Sites like regrettheerror.com report retractions and corrections in news. Another such site is dailygleanerisms.wikispaces.com. The site was created by a Fredericton lawyer to publicize any spelling and factual errors inside the city's Daily Gleaner. Robert Jackson is the creator of the website and says he designed it to make journalists pay better attention. I began to notice a lot of uh, errors in the Gleaner and became uh, concerned that those mistakes were not being picked up on by anyone. The site stopped producing new content a few months ago, but Jackson says it may be back up in the future. News organizations have also made it easier for people to alert them of mistakes, whether it is through a comments page or an email. Larger papers like the New York Times have hired people solely for the purpose of fact-checking the papers. At smaller papers, a story may only be fact-checked by the journalist and his editor. Devin judges the editor of the Bugle Observer. He suggests if a reader is interested in a story and finds a mistake, to call it in. If a reader isn't engaged, then we're not doing our jobs right. So if we are making mistakes, then yes, they should be, they should be calling in. They should be helping us to, to be better at our jobs. Judge says he doesn't think people have a responsibility to fact-check the paper, but he does appreciate those who look deeper into a story. In Woodstock, Tony Bourgeois, Community College News. Professional journalists follow a specific code of ethics outlined by journalistic organizations. However, with the emergence of citizen journalism, there is a shift occurring to include them under the same ethical guidelines as professional reporters. Kyle Dupont has more. With the surfacing of online news as an extensive outlet, many people in the public are accepting of citizen journalists, even though they may not completely trust them. The question that arises is how to bring these new journalists under the same ethical codes as other accredited organizations. Now, rather than being out there and being a blogger not necessarily aware uh, or, and not necessarily practicing certain codes of ethics, isn't it better for the journalistic organizations to say, here are the rules we abide by, why don't you familiarize yourself with them, why don't you join us for training even. Online media allows for various streams for the news, from the Twitterverse to blogging. So how can a journalist's code of ethics be enforced and policed by the proper institutions? But what happens is that by having a public code of ethics, the public that sees a story and disagrees with it can complain to the, to the organization. Many people within the journalism industry have concerns regarding the ethical standards that a citizen journalist is held to. Sometimes citizen journalism strays over more to the rumor side of things and people will take that for gospel only to be burned later on when the story proves not to be true. Organizations such as the RTNDA are currently implementing changes to the code of ethics. They will likely add new terminology which includes online journalists. In Woodstock, Kyle DuPont, Community College News. What kind of roles do citizen journalists play in breaking news events like natural disasters? We find out when we come back. Welcome back. Did you know that when the Egyptian government tried to shut down the internet in that country that citizens were still able to tweet about the news? But closer to home, Charles LeBlanc is one of New Brunswick's best known bloggers. He considers himself a professional nuisance. Carl Dupont spent the day learning how LeBlanc gets his stories. I'm a blogger. So I said, what is a blogger? Is a blogger a journalist or he's not? My view, I say a blogger is a journalist but with an opinion, and opinions I do have. Charles LeBlanc is a familiar name and face throughout the city of Fredericton. A self-proclaimed public nuisance, he covers everything from politics to the issues affecting the average citizen. Charles has his own webpage where he posts his stories for everyone to see. I'm the editor, I'm the columnist, 
and I'm the owner. Charles takes full control of his website and decides what is newsworthy. Through the use of social media, he has been able to create quite a following throughout the region. And uh, tweeting, Facebook, blogging, and via communication, via the information highway is very important for us New Brunswickers to know what's going on. And be safe, and if you don't, the rules are very simple. If you don't like it, we don't use it. Okay? Okay. One interesting thing about Charles is his approach to interviews. He is willing to talk to anyone and everyone to get a story. He shoots all his interviews with a point-and-shoot camera. He doesn't edit his interviews and they go directly to his website as they are. Now you know why social journalism, how we do it. These are four citizens from China. Now personally, I'm not a fan of China uh, because there's no freedom of speech in China. We know that. But these guys are sort of afraid and, you know, you don't blame them. And like they said, well, if you don't say nasty stuff against the government, uh, you're free. So you know what? <laughs> Thank God we're not in China. I would have been in jail a long time ago. <laughs> Charles has a knack for finding news as it happens. The sound of sirens bring him running to get so the latest scoop. Social journalism works. Uh, we're walking down uh, Union Street. Then you see the police truck. Lights bright, uh, sarin going, so of course I threw my coffee aside and my water bottle flew and I came here. Charles is respected by the police in the city. He politely waits for his interview and avoids causing problems because he knows they will take the time to answer his questions. See, that's one thing about when you do this citizen blogging. Uh, you don't uh, bother the police. You gotta be patient, something I don't have. but. You just let them do their business, and they know I'm here. And uh, once he's done, I usually, his name is uh, Sergeant Matt Myers, and I presume he'll give me an update on what, if he's in a bad mood, we don't know. But usually he's, he's, he's pretty good. I, I don't have any issue with it. I, I think that, you know, there's many different forms of uh, media. Um, you know, being a blogger or being a, uh, you know, a journalist with uh, another accredited agency such as a CBC or one of the... Um, you know, CTV. I think they all have a duty to report incidents that are taking place in the community. Um, so I think it's six and one half dozen in the other. I think it's a, a great way for people to be aware of what's going on. The, uh, the Franklin Police Force acknowledged me as a journalist. They put me on their email list and they know to get information quickly to the public. Blogging is the way to do it. Charles has a keen interest in the politics of the province. He can usually be found chasing after different MLAs down at the legislature. Although he has been banned from the grounds, it doesn't seem to stop him from getting his story. When you have a pain in the butt blogger like me that's in there, that asks the same question over and over again every single day. See, I mean, the media is a busy bunch. They jump to other issues every day. But me, when I got way too much time in my hand, I can ask the same question. As long as Charles has a camera and time on his hands, he will be delivering the news as he sees it to the people of Fredericton. And okay, world, well, come and read what I gotta say. NBCC journalism students launched their new website on June 9th in Woodstock. The event featured interactive displays of student work and special guest speaker Terry Sage, host of CBC Radio Fredericton's Information Morning. Visit jschoolmbcc.ca throughout the summer to see more student work. When disasters or national crises break out, mainstream media aren't always the first ones on the scene. Mike Truzak explores the impact of the citizen journalist. Natural disasters, bloody revolutions, and terrorism have become an all too familiar sight in our time. However, in the wake of these horrific events, citizen journalism has played an integral role in how emergencies are covered. Things that are demonstrations happening on the street, and those people are part of those demonstrations, I mean, there's an immediacy that um, is hard, is hard to duplicate in the mainstream media. Veteran journalists like Terry Sagai believe that while citizen journalism can provide the public with information more quickly, there are some glaring barriers in doing this. But now, individuals have that ability themselves, so you don't have to go to the corporate structure to get the story out. 
um, but, it's, but it's fragmented. A 2009 report by Pair Analytics showed that only 4% of tweets out of 2,000 were news related. But some people believe that citizen journalists reporting on disasters and crises is beneficial to everyone. Well, I think that it's a, it's a good thing that people have the ability to get information out there more freely, unfiltered. I think that if you're going to provide a less biased account of disasters, that's the best way to do it. Websites like Ushahidi are acting as a filter for citizen journalists reporting on disasters and crises. In Woodstock, Mike Trusiak, Community College News. Giving a local newspaper a global perspective isn't always easy. But when readers take the initiative to report their own experiences abroad, it can bring the world a little closer to home. Jeff Stairs takes a look at one man and his story. The world held its breath when news broke of the devastating earthquake in Haiti in January 2010. Millions were glued to their television screens watching coverage of the disaster. Woodstock High School teacher Richard Blackyear witnessed the destruction firsthand when he visited the country soon after the quake. I saw everything that you see on television. You know, the devastation, the misery, uh, the deplorable conditions. Though his trip lasted only a few days, Blackyear left Haiti with a lifetime's worth of memories. The local newspaper jumped at the chance to publish his accounts. Blackyear's experiences in Haiti were so overwhelming that he wrote enough to publish a three-part column in the Bugle Observer, like this one here. Blackyear's articles put a local slant on an international story, highlighting a number of area residents who were affected by the disaster. Bugle Observer managing editor Jim Dumville arranged to have the columns printed. He says that Blackyear's work transcended the typical news story and didn't shy away from the emotional. So it became uh, much more than just your description of Haiti after an earthquake. It became, it became very personal about, and you got the human tragedy was, it came across. Oh man, the drivers, you've never seen drivers as bad. Blackyear's articles generated positive feedback in the community. He hopes that some were able to feel a closer bond to the people of Haiti through his words. When you write about something that you feel passionately about and that's very emotional, I think if, if you're sincere in your emotions and people see that sincerity in, in what you write, and I, I felt that, you know, that, uh, that they were, my efforts were validated by the response I got. Not satisfied with just one trip to Haiti, Blackyear is planning another visit for later this year. In Woodstock, Jeff Stairs, Community College News. Well, that's our show for today. If you'd like to see more of our news stories, visit jschoolnbcc.ca. Thanks for watching. During the production of this program, the city of Vancouver saw riots break out following their team's loss in the Stanley Cup Finals. Citizen journalists were out in full force with their cameras. You see the technology of today, everybody posing with photographs. Jazz, if you pick some of that off, look at this guy right here. He's got a tripod set up. It's like he's taking tourist photos. One website called for photo submissions in an attempt to identify those who were inciting violence. Vancouver police also used amateur video to aid in their investigation. Members of the public are sending us their videos and we are adding those to the thousands of minutes of video that we shot ourselves. We are fully committed to tracking down these criminals and arresting them for their crimes. Thousands of photos are already published online, but is this a grassroots form of investigative journalism or simply public shaming?